Welcome back to our classroom in computational physics. Today we move on and discuss what might be an optional topic is certainly a more advanced topic, or at least gets to be a more advanced topic, uh, than many of the elementary works we're talking about. But we're talking about fluid, computational fluid dynamics, and we're working our way up to that. So today we'll talk about shock waves and solitons. So these are fascinating subjects. They're both subjects which are often left out in physics. Maybe you see it in freshman physics, but probably not after that. And they're left either to graduate school or to engineers to do. But they're really great physics subjects, and there are uh, lots of structure, lots of challenges, lots of interest in the subject matter. So we'll work our way up today. Uh, we'll eventually, we'll end up with solitons, but we'll see how they come about. So. Let's talk about it, but let's remind you we're still solving partial differential equations, and we're still solving waves. So if this is the first time you're looking at waves with partial differential equations numerically, I recommend you go back and you start looking at waves on a string. So let's get started. Read over, if you will, for a second, then I'll read it out loud, uh, this next quote, which is our inspiration for today's lecture. Okay, I'll read it over and you can try to follow or just listen or uh, turn the volume down and read, whatever you want. <coughs> okay, so J. Scott Russell, in 1834 on the Edinburgh Glasgow Canal, wrote in his journal I was observing the motion of a boat which was rapidly drawn along a narrow channel by a pair of horses. When the boat suddenly stopped, not so the mass of water in the channel which it had put in motion. It accumulated round the prow of the vessel in a state of violent agitation, then suddenly, leaving it behind, rolled forward with great velocity, assuming the form of a large solitary elevation, a large solitary elevation, a rounded, smooth, and well-defined heap of water, which continued its course along the channel apparently without change of form or diminution of speed. I followed it on horseback and overtook it still rolling on at a rate of some eight or nine miles an hour, preserving its original figure some thirty feet long and a foot and a foot foot to a foot and a half in height. Its height gradually diminished, and after a chase of one or two miles, I lost it in the windings of the channel. Such in the month of August 1834 was my first chance interview with that singular and beautiful phenomena. Wow. Well, this quote shows you that scientists don't write the way they used to. But anyway, what it shows you here, and I've outlined it or emphasized it in red, is some of uh, the basic features of solitons, which Russell observed and put down very well. He observed here a mass of water. So it's not a general wave every place, but sort of a finite bunch of water, which then starts out and forms these solitary waves. The water starts off in a sense of violent agitation, doing everything, and then it rolls forward, and some part of it anyway has a great velocity. So it's obviously fast, and then it assumes the form, not immediately, but as it rolls forward, of a single large elevation, a spike. Okay. Uh, that moves along, and then it goes forever without changing speed, and eventually, 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 it loses shape, but a, a very long time. So here, when we're done, what we'll lead you up to here, all the way at the top here, the KDV equation, we'll look at solitons. But here now is a Python code available to you, which actually computes the equations that produce a soliton lets you see a soliton forming. So let's open that, assuming it's opening. So there you see a bore of water. You see a, just a, a slight step, and that step is breaking up now into pieces. And the biggest, tallest amplitude is the biggest piece, and it runs forward forever. Okay? So I'll run this again and show you what we're talking about. But here we have the end result. We have a bu bunch of little waves that started with that sort of step function. And how many are there? One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, maybe eight. Okay? And those are called each one of those is solitons, but the characteristic of a soliton is that the bigger the amplitude, the faster the wave. And so the the part with the biggest amplitude moves most quickly. So in time, these will be left behind and you'll have one big wave. This may sound familiar to you from the news. This is how a tsunami forms. Tsunami forms when an ocean floor falls down, it gives you that right little edge to the water, and then the water moves forward, turns into soliton. So we'll run it again. Uh, we'll close it and run it again. And you see here, that's the bore, the square step. And then you see it forming the big first soliton and some other ones, and they just move ahead. So that's our problem. Can we figure out how to compute, what kind of a theory is needed for solitons, and then how to compute it. Okay? So it's obviously an interesting problem. It's obviously a problem which had been around for quite some time without being understood and had recently been rediscovered. But we'll get to that. So let's look at the next slide and figure out how we go about this challenge. OK, so what we want to do is continue our discussion of waves and their solution via partial differential equations. Okay? Uh, if you haven't seen the string yet, go back, learn about the string, do those exercises, because this builds on that, and we won't spend much time here talking about the development of the algorithm, because it just repeats what was done there with a different equation. But what we're interested in doing is both extending the theory so that uh, we can include nonlinearities, dispersion, hydrodynamics, and then discussing the new physics. Because what's surprising is you may think, and it's pr probably true, there's some more complications needed in order to get the physics to describe a soliton. What's surprising is you can understand the equation, or the bits and the pieces of the equation, and where they come from. So it's not a surprising equation. So that's what we'll do. <coughs> okay? And this topic of fluids is an old subject. But it's a deep subject. There's lots uh, of uh, understanding, some quite mathematically sophisticated, and quite a few challenges in solving these equations. So it's nice to have some problems which are really challenging, which use computing power and are only open to numerical techniques. And these are them. Okay? So we'll have complicated equations, nonlinear. We'll also have unstable solutions. And we'll have a case where it's rare to have an analytic solution. And these solutions are unstable in two senses. They could be numerically unstable because the algorithms have to handle all these complications. But the physics can be unstable as well. Shock waves are unstable. So we'll work, we'll, we'll do that. Okay? But these are important problems. Uh, once you build in realistic boundary conditions, you could talk about you know, solution of airplane wings, torpedoes, boats in the water, whatever. The boundary conditions, DC here, that you have to put on these partial differential equations are non-intuitive. So the more samples you can work through, the more examples you become familiar with, the more you can build up some intuition about what's the appropriate boundary condition for these equations. And as we'll see, solitons is one of these subjects which modern computation was essential to understand. So their discovery were made experimentally by Russell, and even later analytically, uh, took modern computational power to have their full development. So, and it's still a very interesting topic. So let's look at the next slide. <coughs> there are a number of equations needed in order to describe fluids. The most familiar one is probably the continuity equation. It may be familiar because you see it in quantum mechanics all the time. And it's the same equation as occurs in fluid flow. And the equation of continuity is no more than a statement of conservation of mass. Whatever mass is flowing into some re region has to flow out. If it spreads out, then it becomes less dense. Fine. But the total mass is the same. So if you put those physical ideas into equations, you get equation 1 and equation 2 here. So equation 1 is the real continuity equation. Equation 2 just defines the current. So if we have a fluid moving 
and the fluid has density rho, mass per unit volume rho, and some velocity, so this is bold V, which means it's a vector. That, by definition, is the current. Okay, so that's the current that's flowing. The continuity equation says the change in time of the density in some finite, small, infinitesimal region of space is equal to minus the divergence of j, or plus the divergence of j equals 0. Okay? So in other words, what divergence of j is just that. It's how the current flowing into some region diverges. Okay? So if we put it on the other side and say, you know, whatever the divergence is, if the current is flowing out, then the density must be increase, decreasing in time. The divergence flows out, density decreases, and that's all the equation says. But del dot j, even though you may see it in electromagnetism, then it's harder to understand. Here it means just that, divergence, you know, flowing outward. Okay? So that's all we've talked about. If we look at a special case now of the continuity equation, so here's the continuity equation up there still, and we say, what if the current that we're describing has a constant velocity? So we're just talking about nothing interesting happening in some region of space, current just flowing along, moving from one part to another. Okay, so then we say the current has a velocity v, which is equal to some constant, which we call c because we're not very original. Okay? So if you put v equal to c in the continuity equation here, and you restrict it to one dimension, you get what's commonly known as the advection equation. So that's the advection equation on the bottom, equation 3. d rho dt plus c is constant to speed of the fluid is equal to plus c times d rho by dx is 0. Okay? So it says the same thing. It says whatever ch change there is in the density is coming about because there's a change in time and a change in space, divergence, which match each other. Okay, so that's the advection equation. And that's an easy equation to solve. Let's look at the solution for a moment because it's such a simple equation and it has the first steps to the physics we'd like. <coughs> so, on the next slide, slide 18, gee, what happens? Time goes so quickly. We have the advection equation. d rho dt plus c, d rho dx is 0. Okay. If you look up the word advection in a dictionary, it has various definitions, one of which, and probably the easiest to understand, is it's just the transportation of salt or any dissolved mineral in water due to the velocity field. In other words, if water is flowing, anything dissolved in the water moves with the water. Anything contained in the water moves along with it. So that's advection. So it's this horizontal flow from one place to another. Convection is usually considered the vertical flow. So it's just moving along with the stream. What's interesting about this the advection equation is, number one, it really looks like a wave equation. It looks like our old friend the wave equation for waves on string, except there we had second derivatives with time and second derivative with space, the same c. So this is like a first order wave equation. And it has solutions that behave like waves. No surprise. I hope it's not a surprise. Okay. The fact, the solutions look like traveling waves. So the solution, if you substitute in for rho, any function of x and t that is really just a function of x minus ct, that's just a traveling wave solution by definition you end up with a solution of this equation. So what it's saying is that if we have, say, a wave here, and the whole you know, fluid's moving along, and there's some surfer person here you know, s sitting on this wave, happy surfer person. He doesn't really need two eyes, OK? OK, this happy, the surfer person's moving along, with the constant velocity of the wave, c, what does the surfer person see? It doesn't see any change, okay? because the, the, the knob just keeps moving along. So that's saying f of x minus ct is a constant, x minus ct is a constant, therefore position is equal to ct. We just have a uh, constant velocity. So that's what I just said here. Okay, and 
That's and the surface speed would be dx by dt, which is c. So if the fluid is moving along at c, and the surface just sitting on this little wave up here, which is also moving along, then everyone moves along with c. Okay, and that's what we mean. So we can solve this equation. We can solve the advection equation using our simple leapfrog te technique, the same as we used for the string, but it's not a good idea. Why? Wasn't it good enough so for strings? Is why shouldn't it be good enough for a bunch of water? Well, it's good enough for, for the advection equation, but we'd like to also use the same type of equation to look for shocks, and that, those are unusual phenomena that requires higher precision numerically. So, if you want to go as your first bit of an exercise, see if you can solve the advection equation, go ahead. You can use the old leapfrog technique, or you can move ahead and use a more sophisticated technique, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So, let's get on. Look at this slide. So, let's start off looking at this slide. We have the figures up there. We may as well look at them. What do we have? We have here two different visualizations. The left done with the new plot, the right done with OpenDX. And they both show an initial sine wave at time equals zero. We have a sine wave in the water. And then time moves along here for the open DX moves along into the plane. And what you see is that this sine wave, which is smooth top and bottom, develops an edge. Becomes rather edgy. Later in time, it develops a perfectly square edge, which you can see here in the color visualization very clearly. <coughs> and the square edge here is the shock wave. And that's an instability, you know, because it keeps getting tighter and tighter, and then the equations break down, and even we don't know what happens, you know, uh, whether the, the equations don't break down, but nature breaks down because of the singularities and derivatives, stress and strain, uh, something happens right there. So, how does the shock wave come about? Well, the advection equation, which we just looked at, told us that if we have the simple equation, if we solve it, we'll get waves hump moving at a constant velocity. Well, if we now say, what if we take for our velocity c, what was c before, you know, so this term here is just our wave velocity c, but we take the wave velocity to be equal to some constant epsilon times u. What is u? u is just the amplitude of the wave. So we have a wave, looks like the advection equation, with a velocity that's proportional to the wave velocity. So this is called Berger's equation. And even great minds like von Neumann studied this equation in order to understand shock waves, because it's as simple as that. And what this equation is saying is that if we have an amplitude which grows, then the speed of the wave grows also with that. So the fast part of the wave separate off from the slow parts and run ahead. Interesting. So equation two here is the same as equation one. It's just the conservative form of equation one, where we, we say this nonlinear term, nonlinear because there's u times u, u squared. Well, that can be written as just the derivative of u squared over two dx with an epsilon in front. So this is just the same Berger's equation in conservative form. We'll use a form like this to, for the numerical solution, because then it looks just like everything we've done before. So what we have here is, again, advection gave us that surfer on a constant hump moving through the water. Now, Berger's equation gives us shock waves, tells us that the parts that move faster, the parts that have greater amplitude, like the part here on the top, will move ahead. And that's what causes this sharp corner to arise. Okay. So if we look here at the uh, next slide, we have an, actually an applet which can show you this. So let me uh, show you this. So here's the applet. So this is our solution. It's, and we just give this a uh, uh, Berger's equation. And we can start off with a wave here. We can change its uh, speed or not, leave it at 
and we have a sine wave. And what you see here is the sine wave forming, ooh, a shock wave, just like that. And then, obviously, some numerical instability break, caused the solution to break down, but that's what you'd expect. In real world, the physics will break down, too. So you know, we can reload this. We can try other k values, see what it looks like. And you know it's moving even faster then, and it falls down you know, even, even more. So here's the shock wave, a little slower. But even though the whole wave is moving slower, you see the effect coming more and more. Here it didn't go as far, but you can see the square edge forming. So how do we now solve for a shock wave? Well, we just need to solve Berger's equation again. But we need to do it with something better than standard leapfrog. And it, the method that we recommend, which seems to work at least up until the last instant when everything breaks down, is the Lax-Wendorf method, LW method. So it's based on starting with the conservative form of the Berger equation. That's it. And now we can move ahead, use the usual approach to move ahead. Okay, so we just express the derivatives in terms of central differences and separate off the time derivative to give us an equation which lets us step ahead one step from a previous step, <coughs> which is the equation here. And beta is just this combination of co constants which come in. And much like we discussed previously for the Courant condition, this combination determines the stability of the numerical solution. And generally, beta, this combination of wave speed divided by algorithm speed, this combination should be less than 1 for a numerically stable solution. Okay. If we uh, write this solution down now, uh, if we make the expansion in the time derivative, and we keep a second order term, we then get this improved algorithm. So keeping the second order term, which is what you should do to get shock waves and get more numerical stability, gives us a more complicated algorithm. But basically, it's still just time stepping. You know, to x uh, i here is the x position, j is time. So on the left, we have time j plus 1. On the right, we have previous time, okay, just the step before. So we can just move ahead, one step at a time. And time step, it's a little more complicated equation. Beta is evolved beta squared. And obviously, if you wanted to get closer and closer to that edge when all uh, edges break down, when you saw the numerical solution break down, you can keep yet higher order terms in the algorithm. But we won't do that. So uh, we've shown you the code. And now we advise, we'll take a break after this. We advise that you go either write your own code or take our version of the code, look and solve Berger's equation. See if you can generate the same shock waves. Okay? Solve Berger's equation. You can try it first with the simple leapfrog method. See how well it works. That's the best idea. Uh, and then modify it so you can actually get shock waves okay? and get better solutions. So modify it to the lax wendorf method. Then compare the two methods. See if the improved algorithm really is an improvement. So that's good. And then when you see that you can get reasonable solutions, see how far you can push it. See how small you can make delta x and delta t independent of each other. Or likewise, see how close you can get to beta less than 1, greater than 1, and see what instabilities look like. So you see in the program here really two different kinds of instabilities. You'll see one instability coming about because nature itself appears to be unstable, and shock waves can be formed. Or, and then you'll see a numerical instability. So those are the two kinds of instabilities. See in your program if they look the same or they look different. So good time to go take a break, go to the lab, work a while, and then we'll generalize Berger's equation to include yet more physics. See you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Welcome back. Recall, we've been discussing Berger's equation, which is a fairly simple equation that lets us generate shock waves, numerically, physically as well. If, uh, presumably, that's the description of a shock wave. We'd like to now continue this discussion 
and see if we can form a soliton, which looks something like a shock wave uh, from Berger's equation or from some generalization of Berger's equation. So we have some work to do. So let's you know, get down to work. Okay. Let's discuss dispersion. Okay. Uh, it turns out that in order to form solitons, we have to understand dispersion, and we have to have dispersion. And you know, often people think friction, dispersion, these are bad things. They're not the ideal world. Uh, it'd be nice not to have them. Well, the truth is both friction and dispersion are actually stabilizing forces in nature. They're very important. Many of the things we count on wouldn't exist without them. So let's see. First of all, do you know what dispersion means? Okay, tell me. Go ahead. What do you think? Say it out loud. Tell me what you think dispersion means. Nobody's hearing. Nah, you probably don't. Okay. So what is dispersion? Well, most people would say dispersion is energy loss. It's when energy is dispersed. Well, that's not true. Dispersion is the loss of information, at least in the physics sense when we're talking about waves. The energy doesn't have to be, it's not loss, that's friction. The energy is just dispersed. Okay? It, the wave disperses and loses the information. Physically, that comes about if a wave is traveling through a spatially regular medium, in other words, a comb or a lattice of sights, okay, something that can interfere with it, then it may disperse. Okay? If it's in vacuum, it won't disperse. The mathematical origin of dispersion is we have a wave equation with higher order powers of the space derivative. So I'll say it again. We need some higher order space derivatives in the wave equation in order to get a dispersion. That shouldn't be obvious to you, but I'll show you that it's true. Okay, we'll work that through and see that's what happens. How do we understand that? Okay, so here let's look. We have our usual plane wave solution written here, and it's a plane traveling wave. Okay, so it's a plane wave like e to the i kx, except here we include the time dependence, and physics typically has the time dependence minus omega t. Okay, so e to the i kx minus omega t is a wave traveling to the right. e to the i kx plus omega t is a wave traveling to the left. That's good. k is the wave vector. Omega is the angular frequency. So these are plane traveling waves. A dispersion relation, in the general mathematical sense, is a relationship between the wave vector k and the angular velocity omega. So I'll say that again. Relation between k and omega is by definition called a dispersion relation. Okay? And we find out what the dispersion relation is by taking a form, taking a solution such as this plane wave, substituting into the advection equation. So if we do that, we have equation one here, which is just the advection equation. So that's the advection equation with a constant c being the speed of the wave in the equation. If we substitute in, the space derivative gives us a minus or plus. Uh, I'm sorry, the time derivative gives us, gives us a minus or plus omega. And the space derivative gives us a plus k. And then we also get an i, but that cancels out. And then the space derivative has a c there. So substituting in the plane wave gives us a relation between omega and k, and it's a linear relation. Omega is plus or minus ck. That's known as dispersionless propagation. It's a dispersion relation, and the plus or minus just means we have waves traveling to the right or the left. Okay? So that's often left out in books with the obvious notation that negative k means going to the left, positive k to the right. But it's a wave in which all parts have the same group velocity. And the group velocity, by definition, is just the derivative of omega with respect to k. You know, so like c was the velocity of the fluid itself flowing. This is now the velocity of a wave propagating in that fluid. And for this dispersionless case, it's just going to be c. But in general, it could be some other number. So the group velocity is just, by definition, the derivative of omega with respect to k. The relationship between omega and k is a dispersion relation. Here, this is called dispersion list propagation if it's linear. 
What if it's nonlinear? Well, the next slide talks about that. Well, if we have a nonlinear dispersion relation, then different frequencies in the wave will propagate at different speeds. If different frequencies in the wave propagate with different speeds, you can think of you know, a voice which has three fundamental frequencies. Each one would propagate at different speeds. The sound becomes distorted. That's just a wave shape becomes distor distorted due to distortion, due to dispersion. Okay. So omega equals ck is dispersionless. Now let's look at the next simplest extension beyond that. And that's given by equation 1 here. And equation 1 says that omega equals ck, that's dispersionless. Now let's add on a small term. So we'll assume the constant beta is small times k cubed. Okay. And you can ask the question, what happened to k squared? We don't like even powers. Why? Well, because even powers would give you a different velocity right and left. And we're at least assuming we don't have that kind of funny medium. If you have a funny medium that does that, then you'd use uh, or even powers as well. But for the same speed right and left, which is what we want, we'll just have odd powers. And there could be higher orders as well. So the group velocity, again, is d omega dk. And we see that now it varies. We have c here, as before, the constant. But now we have a term that depends on k, or the wave vector. And so this says that different wave vectors k, which by equation 1 means different frequencies, uh, propagate with different speeds. That leads to dispersion. That's the definition of dispersion. So that's what we want. Okay. And we've already said if we had uh, even powers, we get right-left asymmetry. So if we now take what was just before the advection equation over here, and now we add on another term, a beta times a third derivative of u with respect to x, we get an equation which has dispersion. Why the third derivative? Well, because recall, you know, we need a k cubed here. Up there's the k cubed. Okay? In order to get k cubed into the, uh, fr from, uh, on a plane wave, e to the i kx minus omega t, we have to have a third derivative. Okay? You know, so we have e to the i k x minus omega t. Okay, if that's a solution, we substitute that in an equation. To get a k cubed, we have to have a third derivative. Okay, so that's, that's where it comes from, right there. So this is now an, similar to the advection equation. Here now, that's just the advection equation uh, with, with, with dispersion. Okay, so you can go take your code which solve the advection equation see the effects of dispersion. See if what I've said is true. If you start off with a hump, it disperses. So let's move ahead. We'll do that, but we'll skip a step. and let you. Uh, we'll wait for you to come back from the lab. But let's look at this next slide, slide 54. OK, so <clears throat> we if we look at the one equation on this slide, the only equation on this slide, we see terms that we recognize. We have du dt plus epsilon u du dx, the Berger equation. So it's just like advection with a v wave velocity that increases depending on the amplitude of the wave. And now we say, oh, but we have dispersion as well. Okay. So that's this third derivative of u with respect to x. Interesting. Now, this is, of course, a nonlinear equation, not because of the third derivative, but because this Berger t equation term, this u squared term, means that we get shock waves. Now, so shock waves will take the wave and have it collapse down into a, a smaller and smaller bundle endlessly. Okay? And that'll give us a shock, which becomes an infinity. But d cubed u dx squared, the dispersion term, does the opposite. Dispersion takes a wave, it tries to spread it out. And so, magically, if we get these constants just right, we can have a balanced situation 
in which the shock wave term is exactly bounced off by the dispersion and we're left with waves which are stable. These are solitons. So as I said, you know, it's an equation. So this is the KDV equation, because I'm not going to say those na names. And it was discovered in 1895, and people found solutions of it. And it gives up, it produces solitons. Okay, and, and it produces solitons by balancing off the effects of shock formation, which tend to make highly singular peak waves, and dispersion, which tends to spread them out. And so that balance is the soliton. This was rediscovered numerically. Okay, so uh, people had solved it back in you know, the 1800s, uh, but then the first numerical solutions, which then led to extensive studies, was 1965. You may think that's a long time ago, but some of us think, no, can even remember back that far. So what you see here is, and you saw a movie of this, we started. So now we, we see here two interesting things, and you can go back, they all agree with Russell's observation. We see here the bore, so we just have a little step in the water, and here's time, and you can see our solution showing that this step then de develops one peak, another peak, and here you can see it has this characteristic eight, six to eight peaks. These are like the Fourier spectrum for nonlinear solitons. The biggest, the first one is the highest in amplitude, which you can see here. It moves away the fastest. And these are very stable. So in this next visualization, what you're seeing is something quite amazing. You're seeing here two soliton, two solitary waves interacting with each other. So we have a big soliton here, this big guy here, and then we have a small guy here, and this, they're both moving towards each other at time zero. So this is time zero. And usually, especially like quantum mechanics, optics, when you have two waves overlapping, what do they do? Go ahead, say it. What do two overlapping waves do? Interfere? Is that what you think? Wait, don't waves interfere? The answer is, usually they do, but those are linear waves. When you deal with nonlinear waves, you have other effects. So these wa waves, you know, interference would be either constructive very high, destructive very low. These guys just pass right through each other unscathed. And you see here, the, the big, the soliton wave keeps going to the right with its amplitude growing. Okay. And the small soliton wave here moves to the left, not very much because it's slow, because it has a small amplitude. And they pass through each other, and there's the solitary wave. So not only are these things funny in that they can get a very high velocity, very high amplitude, they're very stable. That's why Russell saw them there. They didn't get interfered away. They keep going forever. So they're quite unusual. They're quite important in many areas of science. Okay, so let's take a little break. Look at this next slide. There we talk about how you solve the equation analytically. We don't want you to do it, but we, we can't hide this from you. Okay, well, we're almost done. But you know, we want you to solve it numerically. But it's interesting to see how... Given, you know, given enough time, mathematicians will come up with a solution to m even the most difficult equations. But the, you know, these people have to work very hard and long, and there's no generalized technique for doing it. So equation one here is the KDV equation we wish, we wish to solve. Uh, first time derivative, a u squared term with a space derivative. That gives us the uh, shock wave, and a third order space derivative that gives us dispersion. If you assume a traveling wave solution, you assume u is just a function of c here, x minus ct. You know, for the advection equation, ev every function of this form was a solution. It's no longer a solution here. But if you substitute it in, you get equation 3, which says, ooh, well, this is a solution if you can find some u for which the u, the c, for th this is true. But what we have in equation 3 is now an ordinary differential equation. So go back. Equation 1 was a partial differential equation because it had time derivatives and it had space derivatives. Great, okay? Those are hard to solve. You have to be clever. Well, you know, 
give mathematicians their due. They're clever. They make the substitution, assuming it has a wave-like form, traveling wave form, and you're left with an ordinary differential equation. It may not be one whose solution you're familiar with, but it, you will be after this. Okay? So it has this secant squared kind of form, and there is our uh, phase chosen. There is our traveling wave inside. So if you remember what a secant squared looks like, after all, it's just an exponential e to the x and plus e to the minus x, the plus or minus sign. Uh, so this looks like a lump. okay? And so this is what gives us a solitary lump. So in fact, this is an analytic solution. The numerical solution, and this is wh where we want you to go off into the uh, lab and do the work, the numerical solution is not trivial. You know, when I f was first teaching this course, one student said, uh, took it, uh, was a grad student, said he had just done his master's thesis solving this equation. Okay. You know, so if w it was, you know, this was in the 70s, it was, it was that challenging, maybe it was the 80s, probably the 80s, it was in the 80s. In the 1980s, it was still that challenging to find good s numerical solutions. So we don't expect you to derive your own. Here is the, uh, the algorithm we're using for the KDV equation. And what we're doing is it has the usual central difference for the first time derivative and for the second, but then we have increased precision, just like we used for the, uh, ad for the Berger equation. We used a four point, one higher order term, for in order to handle the third derivative. So if we do that, we, we get this. Again, it's time-stepping leap, leapfrog method. Uh, it's rather complicated in order to include the appropriate initial conditions uh, and the boundary conditions uh, in order to get this thing started. We talk about that in the text. What's interesting here is you get a more complicated relation between stability and the floating point error that's arrives. So if you do the error analysis, just looking at the terms left out in the finite difference method, you find that the error goes like third order in time and th second order space times third order times delta t, which makes the whole thing third order, in mixed space time. So the error goes like third order, which is good. It's a second order accurate solution. And the stability requires this combination of time and space steps. So. What do we want you to do? We want you to work hard. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> you can look at the code. This is the uh, solution we've started off with. Okay, so we want you to take this code, run it, and see that it gives you solid time. See that they really exist. Then look at the solution. You know, look at it and make three-dimensional graphs. Make animations. See that uh, it works the way you expect. What is the way you expect? If you start off with a bore, it'll give you solid time. If you start off with a single solid time, it should give you a single solid time forever. So you have an analytic function. You can use that as the initial condition. That should go on forever. Okay? Likewise, you can start off with initial conditions of two solid times banging into each other or crossing. They don't bang. They just go right through each other. Another interesting check. Likewise, see what happens with... Uh, the stability, you have both delta t and delta x to vary. And then, obviously, you can't solve this in infinite space unless you have an infinite computer and infinite time. So you have to put the solid times in a box. See what effects the reflections off the edge of the box have. They may break up the solid time. They may not. They may mess up the stability. So plenty to expo explore. I will see you next time. And then we'll talk some more about computational fluid dynamics the next step. So, happy computing. Enjoy the new subject area. Bye-bye.